Well, hey guys, welcome into the Next Man Up podcast. Mark Staniford, your host here. Honored, as always, to be with you for another episode. Hey, whether you're joining us today for the first time or you've been with us for a while, we're grateful you have chosen to be part of this community, which is about being and raising healthy and godly men. And my sidekick and friend, John Gregory, is back with us for another episode. Dude, good to see you. Good to see you. Play ball. <laughs> a baseball theme today. Yes. Do you know why? You you know why. Today is as we record this is the second day, second game of a five game over four days series between my boys, the Cardinals, and those other that other team. From uh, it's hard to say it, Chicago. Oh, oh, the I'll say it for you, the Cubs, the Cubbies. Mm-hmm. And they're playing right now, so I'm a little distracted because I forgot that they were playing until you know, anyway. So play ball. Okay, play ball. Let's let's play. I'll, I'll try to stay focused. Good. I need you to stay focused today because okay. Um, the the title of the of this episode is Romans Twelve Men. But I, I'm not exactly sure where that came from, or mm. I have an idea where we might be going with that. So if you could like peel your eyes away from your MLB app and like set the context here, that that yes. would be super helpful for me <laughs> and I'm sure for the listeners too. No doubt, Romans 12, man. There's a book. Well, let me just clarify. There's not one. Maybe there <laughs> should be one. Okay. Uh, and we're not going to write it. Maybe I, I need to stop. Where did this come from? Yes, good question. So a friend of mine called me, uh, I don't know, a couple months ago or now. And <clears throat> we have a very interesting relationship. And he lives in, he lives in Atlanta. And uh, he'll, he'll just randomly call me. And we just start talking about whatever is on his brain. Okay. And we, and when we when he's done, we're done. So he there's just, very little catch up it, about whatever's going on. He just he's got something he's thinking about and he calls and throws it out and I'm probably more of a sounding board than anything else, which is fine. And when he's done, we're like, all right, till next time. You know, that's that's our conversation. He just invites you a, into his brain for a yes. bit. And when he's had it out, he's like, yeah. okay, I don't yeah. need you anymore. Let's I mean, he is interested in my thoughts, but it's more he there's this space. He probably has it with other people, but you know, there's this space of the John, his name's Eric, John Eric phone call thing that happens. Okay. It's right. very random and it just happens. So I pick up the phone. I normally do, <laughs> not always, but uh, I pick up Eric's phone calls. And that was not one of those moments. Mm. So this was, oh, this is different. I wouldn't say it was a cry for help because that's not really what it was. It was almost like I just need space to tell somebody I'm in a what the hell mode. Mm. Not in a negative way, just like I need, I just need to unload here for a moment. I'm not in a bad space. I just need to unload. Mm -hmm. So he did. And one of the comments he made while he was telling what was going on, he's probably about 40. He said, college, Eric, what college Eric thought he was going to be doing in his life is not at all what he's doing at age 40. Mm. And he, again, he didn't say that from a negative space. That's not at all where he was. He was just acknowledging today. I'm realizing my life is not what I thought it was going to be. Now to give context here, Eric's happily married has three biological, uh, they're all boys, has three biological children. Uh, He and his wife probably, I don't know, five or six years ago, went down the foster parent lane. And they have taken on like really 
hard, wow. hard cases. Wow. And in this particular moment, uh, one, one prior foster child who's aged out of the system randomly showed up at the door with her own child. Mm. So there's seven kids in the house. And that's not at all what college age Eric did not see that in the car envisioned and you know what he does for a living and, and so forth. So I, I got off that phone call and he talked through his stuff and he it literally drove through Starbucks and got his fix and we were done. He's like, okay, I'm done. I'm better now. Like, okay. Next time. So I get off that phone call and I'm just sitting in it, you know, honestly, I'm praying for him and thinking about his situation and, and lifting him up. And I'm like, that dude is living out Romans 12. Mm. That's what I said to myself. And what I meant by that was particular words in the first two verses of Romans 12. There's a lot in that whole chapter. So just zeroing in on those two verses. So when Paul talks about, here's where we're going to get scriptural now. When Paul talks about presenting yourselves as a living sacrifice, in my mind, Eric's living that out because if he had said, I'm going to, I'm going to live out my college dream, no matter what, forget whatever else God may tell me or my wife would like to do, or blah, da, 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 da. this is what I'm going to do. That's not Romans 12. So I thought it'd be an interesting topic to bring up here and encourage all of us to think about ourselves as men, uh, husbands and fathers, how do we live out? And that's just one, one phrase from those two verses, but how do we live out Romans 12? So interesting, um, interesting story with Eric, but, but as you're processing that and working through, it's interesting that you go to these these two verses as like this is this although for him it looks significantly different than what he thought 20 years ago or whatever it is what you can see is that he's he's evidence of what Paul was writing about in, in these these first two chapter or first two verses of, of chapter 12 so you you pose the the question like how how do you do that and and maybe, for maybe for the listener who's who's driving and or doesn't have their Bible app in front of them or whatever that you you can you can kind of g- give us a quick recap of what these what these two verses say in particular and then then we can transition to how, like how do you, how do sure. you do that what does it mean mm-hmm. to live out Romans twelve one and two Yeah, so not just to verbatim quote quote them, but there's three I'll say key principles or truths that Paul is uh, challenging us to take on. And one is to, I've already mentioned it, but consider yourself a living sacrifice. We can talk 30 minutes about that, but that that's one of those. The second one is by being transformed, he says, by the renewing of your mind. Man, there's so much to talk about with that. But renewing your mind uh, I, I would just say that that's our effort to constantly allow God the space that he needs in our minds and in our spirits to make us more like him. Mm. That it, there is true transformation going on. So, you know, back to Eric's statement, you know, when he was 22, graduating college, Thank God he's not still a 22-year-old living like a 22-year-old when he's 20 years older, Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. You know, he's allowed transformation and renewal of his wishes, of his wants, of his thoughts, uh, and his obedience to happen. So that's why I say but he's living that out. And the third thing in those two verses is to discern one scripture, one uh a translation says, discern what the will of the father is. Mm-hmm. So you could just say, discern what the father wants. So in this case, in Eric and his wife's case, 
uh, they didn't know they were going to be foster parents at age 22. But at some point along the way, they discerned that's what God wants them to be. So those are the thoughts that I had of this is how, at least from this family's, how I'm watching this family live out their life as followers of Jesus. They're doing these three things. They're pursuing them. I have always enjoyed these verses, but I would say in the last... I would say in the last decade, I've come to understand them in a, in a different way. Uh, and, and part of what has helped is, as I mentioned to you before we started recording, the message translation, Eugene Peterson's translation, which, I mean, he was intending to make it a little bit more contemporary and accessible with the words and the language. Right. But for right. these verses in particular... It really helped me to think of it in a in a different way, and and, and maybe in um, I'll, I'll come back to this thought in in a bit, but in a way that is within my control and my responsibility, not just like the divine's responsibility to transform me and make mm-hmm. me different, but like what is what's mine to do here? Yeah, um, and, and so a couple of things. That, that stand out in that in that message translation when he talks about sacrifice in that in that first verse, it, it's take your everyday life, your ordi- the ordinary things that you do every day as part of living and let that be a sacrificial offering in in in, in um, to the to the father. Um, that that second component about renewing your mind, Peterson takes the perspective of not conforming to culture, not just Mm -hmm. automatically, here's how I would say it, following the crowd and just going with the flow, but being a critical thinker and asking questions and and maintaining a focus that isn't just a herd mentality. And then the, the third thing um, desi- understanding, discerning what God wants is is the more traditional translation. The Peterson translation is growing and developing a well formed maturity. And I don't remember when I first read the message translation, but I can tell you of the thousands of verses that are in that translation, these two resonated with me as much, if not more than any other Mm. of the verses that I've read in that translation. For me, it was just a way to really amplify, like I said, what, not just what father's doing, but what I can do and how I can cooperate in, um, in the process as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm going to keep my brain just wants to keep looking at this through the lens of my experience of, of my friend and observing him from a distance. Mm. Um, and so when you say everyday stuff, I'm <laughs> sorry, I'm going to be a little crass here, but I'm not really sorry. Um, the two, two thoughts here. One, this is a, a suburban white family. Their foster kids are black kids. That in itself is is countercultural. That's right. So there's that. And his boys, I'm, I'm looking through all of this as what are his boys seeing? Mm. What are his boys observing that they may really never talk about, at least not at their age because they're too young, but they're watching what their dad is doing. And one of the things that Eric uh, told me is uh, the two younger foster kids that they have right now that they've had for a couple of years. Biologically, physically, they should be able to you know, go to the bathroom on their own. They can't. Eric is literally changing diapers on kids that are older than his own kids. Mm-hmm that physically should be able to, but for... Yep, they're still in diapers. That they just, they're still in diapers. I mean, that's, you want to talk about everyday living. 
that's Romans, in my mind, that's just Romans 12 playing out right there. And that's a choice that they've made. And they're, they're not running from it. They are embracing it. And even when it gets challenging, you know, the transformation of your mind is like, okay, I've had enough. Nope. They're, they're still sticking with it. And that is, that is countercultural, even in itself. That right there is countercultural. We are living as Gentiles. We are recording this as Gentiles 2,000 years removed from the time of this writing. And yet it seems as if often we make spirituality still going to the temple to offer the sacrifice, to, to do the ritualistic expression of our religion and our devotion to the God. And I'm not trying to make light of Judaism or the Old Testament, but as you're describing, as, as you're talking, I'm, I'm picturing the Old Testament rhythm of going up to Jerusalem and going to the temple and offering sacrifice. And I think even today, we can get caught up in picturing, quote unquote, sacrifice as these big things, these uber spiritual things that we do on behalf of God and miss and miss what we're talking about here, that what if our entire lives, the mundane, the boring, the unseen, the, the, what feels like languishing sometimes. What if all of that and the big things and the milestones, what if all of that really is a way for us to sacrificially honor our creator? I think it is. Yeah. To sit here and say, a forty-year-old man who's uh, he lives somewhat as, as a stay-at-home dad. Not it's not quite that one hundred percent. But to say that that's not an offering to God, I think you're missing the mark. Mm. It from where I sit, you know, here's. He and his wife both have chosen to take care of someone else's kid, the fatherless. I mean, that's scriptural, right? That's right. Take that's care right. of the fatherless to the point that he's he's having to do things for these other children that are not his, that he's not even having to do for his own kids. And they're they're willing, they're both willing to do that. And that's a sacrifice that I believe honors God, just like whatever you put in the offering plate, if not more. I think our culture today really, it celebrates the extrovert. It celebrates the outward, the, the grand slam that wins the game in the bottom of the ninth, not just the home run, but the grand slam, right? Oh, our, yeah. our culture really celebrates that. And I think men often celebrate the performance or, or focus just on the big performance aspects. And in so doing, we lose sight of the, the little, the consistent, right. the discipline, the, the routine, the everyday stuff of changing diapers for someone else's kid, going out of your way to help somebody else, honoring someone who is not honoring you, right? Like all, all of those things are part of living sacrificially and, and honoring what the, what the creator wanted. I think there's an, there's another angle here that I'd love to just share and, and tease out a little bit. Um, not only did the Eugene Peterson translation help me think about this, what, what Paul might've been saying in a different way. I, I, I will admit for a long time, John, I found myself not knowing how to renew my mind, to, to like to sit in that space. Um, it, it was it was almost as if I just I expected God to to heal me of of my <laughs> mind problems, right? Right, right. Like come save me, come rescue me. And 
this has been a theme in my journey over the last 15 years, but when I realized that I have some responsibility here, I have Mm -hmm. some ownership on my own mind here, then I also realized, boy, like, okay, if I'm responsible, what does that mean? How do I do that? Mm -hmm. And what has come to light in, in my journey over the last five or six years, particularly in this coaching space or in this type of space here is our physiology allows us to regulate our emotions, to discern and assess our thoughts. We may have thoughts that come into our mind that aren't, that, that are thoughts that we don't want and we can get rid of them. And, and mm-hmm. we can focus on the ones that are beneficial and healthy, right? Paul wrote about that even before we had brain science to back up our ability to do it. But as I learned about thought and emotion and visualizing and self-talk, all these things that for 20 years in my adulthood, I had just either ignored or had avoided, it started to become real to me how you live out transforming your mind, renewing your mind. And yes, there's a spiritual component. Don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that I am autonomous here and I, I don't want to play the role of God. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is it's cooperative. And there is mm-hmm. a part that I yeah. play in learning mm-hmm. how we were designed as humans, cooperating with what I refer to as the operating system of our wiring we can do this. And when we learn how to do it, it gives us the ability to do what Paul has asked us to do, described for us to do, and then we get we get to experience the benefits of, of this. That, for me, it was as revolutionary as reading Peterson's description or Peterson's translation, and the two combined, it's like, it's a game changer, man. It's an absolute mm-hmm. game changer for me. So I'm going to give an example of this and see if you feel like, yeah, that that actually is an example. Or no, John, you're off base. Uh, speaking of off base, the Cardinals are now up nine to four. Okay. The <laughs> score um, <laughs> just highlight there. Um, for the majority of my life, I just how I'm wired, but also how I've allowed myself to think. Majority of my life, the, almost the minute I wake up on a daily basis, my brain starts going. It, there's, there's no, you know, easing into the it's day. It's just on. The brain, you know, just goes. And typically, what I have come to find maybe, I don't know, probably four or five years ago, where those thoughts were very negative mm. immediately. So there was an opportunity that I became aware of, you know, how I start my day, how I allow myself to think, what I choose to think about can pretty much dictate how the rest of the day is going to go. That's right. If I don't do some correcting to that. Now, generally, I would correct that, you know, by having some quiet time, you know, scripture reading, prayer time before I left you know, to go do work today and, you know, my brain's in a little better space, but I've, I determined that wasn't enough before I even get out of bed. I need to alter that. I, I need to address that. So what I've started doing, and I don't do it every day, but you know, when, when I give myself the space and listen well enough, It, it sounds pretty simple, but I try to at least think of three three things that I'm grateful for to God mm. to alter that instead of whatever I my brain wants to go on, problem solve or, you know, complain about, you know, whatever. Hit the pause button and actually stop that recording, you might say, and start a different one. Yeah. And, it, and it's an actual conversation. It's a prayer. You know, God, I'm grateful today for da, da, da. Literally, I'm not kidding you, Mark. I have not told anybody this yet. The other day, I don't know why, 
but I literally said to God, I'm grateful for my teeth. I'm not kidding you because I just, my brain just went down this road of what if I didn't have teeth or what, you know, just all this what if stuff about my teeth. And I'm like, that's a really cool thought. I never really thought about being grateful that I have teeth, but it's true. And it changed, I mean, even if I say this right now, you and I are laughing at each other at the screen, but it's a totally shift. And what I could be choosing to, to dwell on that that's renewing of my mind to start the day when I choose to do it. Now, is that a fair example of what we're talking about? Spot on to what we're talking about. Absolutely spot on. Yep. Yep. You're noticing what's happening in your brain. You are deciding that it's not beneficial for you or it it doesn't produce in you or for you what you want. And so you change it. And when you do change it, your focus is different. Your thought pattern is different. And what I'm hearing is the results are different too, right? Like you wouldn't do it if it wasn't working. You've found some success and, and it's worked for you. And so, yes, spot on, 100% right example. By the way, I often, uh, when I first started disciplining myself, which is part of renewing your mind. That's by right. The way, uh, when I started disciplining myself to do this, because of my music capacities and way of thinking, I would try to listen to it in my conversation with God in that moment, what's a song that I could play right now that validates this conversation? Like, I'm not even gonna get out of bed, I'm gonna open my music app and play this song that supports it, encourages it, makes it deeper, and let that be the start of my day. Um, that's been some actually quite cool moments. It, it's a it's a creative approach that reinforces for you the thought that you want. And mm -hmm. and, and okay, so I'm not a scientist. I'm not a brain specialist. But what I have learned is that our brain will give us what it thinks we want. It will see what we are wanting to look for. It's like when you when you buy a new car and you think nobody else has this car until you're driving it home and you see 15 of them on your way home, not just same car, same color, right? Like it's just that your brain, you've told your brain now, this is important to me and it's on the lookout for it. Right. And so you begin to notice when you tell your brain these important, these positive thoughts, these different thoughts and ideas, they're important to me. Your brain is, your brain is going to look for them. Your brain is also in many respects, so efficient that it will just rerun the same paths over and over oh, and yeah. over and yeah. over. Good and bad. Good yeah. and bad. That's right, right? Your, your yeah. brain is efficient. Sometimes I refer to it as a little bit lazy. That's probably not quite fair. But your brain is, is taking cues and saying, oh, I've seen this before. We must be going down this path. But it's possible to arrest that and rewire the brain. This is neuroplasticity is the term that we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. It's possible to rewire the brain. Now, it doesn't happen overnight. It takes discipline and routine and patterns that, that become habits, but it's possible. And I think what that speaks to is the way that we can cooperate with the renewing of our mind process. Now, again, it's not completely on us, but I do believe we've been given the ability if we're willing to, to understand it and exercise it. And for those that do, it's super beneficial. Why, why do we have all these areas of modern science today that talk about establishing a morning routine, that talk about meditation 
and mindfulness practices and breath techniques and all of these all of these techniques to get centered and present and and focused like this is exactly what Paul was telling us to do 2000 years ago we just have the equipment and the knowledge today to be able to to say oh it it does work even outside of the spiritual context, and some might accuse me of heresy here, but outside of the spiritual context, this stuff works. It makes your life better. It allows you to be focused on who you are becoming and go in that direction. But when you couple it with the creator, again, my yeah. language here is we're, we have a built-in operating system. When we cooperate with that operating system and we get to know the coder for that operating system, mm -hmm. well, then that's, that's the place where God wants us to be. You know, I didn't know Paul because he, you know, we didn't... A few generations before you. Coexist, right? <laughs> so I can't say that he was saying, if you do this and then do this and then do this, you know, there's, there's a sequence here in these two verses. However... My gut says that if you want to discern what the will of the Father is, you're going to have a better chance of doing that if you've done number one and number two. That's right. So if that doesn't encourage me <laughs> to do them, I don't know of a better motivator because one of the one of the questions that gets posed all the time to me is something along the lines of, well, I don't, either I don't know how to hear from God or I try and he's not telling me anything and he's just quiet or uh, I, I don't know what he wants. Maybe all he's telling you to do, well, maybe he's not even telling you anything yet because he's waiting. Maybe he's just waiting for you to be willing to change the diaper. Mm -hmm. Maybe he's just willing, waiting for you to be to make the choice to say, my mind, I'm going to do something about my mind, about what I choose to think about. And then that allows the Holy Spirit to have that access and that freedom to speak. And the volume is much louder mm. and clearer mm. because you've made those first two choices. In my life, I would say that's why, that's how those that particular verse plays out. Uh, I can't expect number three if I haven't done one and two. My wife had a, uh, a community Bible study leader for a number of years who would often say this, that God is a gentleman. And in this context, it was, it was all, all ladies. So lady leader speaking to lady participants, but describing God as a gentleman who does not force himself upon those, uh, upon his kids, upon those that, that follow him. We must be willing, we must be ready, we must be available and accept the invitation that is there. But it, it's incumbent upon us to be in that space, that posture of I'm willing, I'm ready, I'm mm -hmm. available, I will, mm -hmm. I will cooperate. Uh, otherwise, we're, we're not likely going to see or hear what's, what he has for us. Yeah. So if you, will make, if you want to be a Romans 12 man, be the gentleman. So guys, I'll pose a question to you as we land the plane here that was given to me. I, I went to a friend a, a couple of months ago and and said, look, man, I'm I'm in a I'm in a challenging situation and I'm not sure how to navigate through this. And I'm not sure I'm not sure how to even pray about it. And he's like, well, when I'm in that situation, here's what I often do. I just go back to God and say, what do you want to do? What do you want to teach me? How, what, what do you want me to see and learn? How do you want me to show up in this situation? And then just put it back on the Father and, and listen to what He tells you. And so as, as you guys are hearing us in this dialogue on, on this, this topic, 
maybe for you, that next step, that action, that takeaway from here is to go back to Father and acknowledge the challenge that you are in, whatever that is, the situation, the circumstance, the, the mind space, the head space that you're in, and just in, invite Father to answer the question, what do you want to do in me and through me in this situation? Or how can I cooperate with you and what you are doing so that I can, I can grow and you can be glorified? Maybe that resonates with you. Maybe it doesn't. You're going to can all those thoughts and you're going to go a different direction because you know that next step that's best for you to take. It doesn't matter to me as long as you're taking that next step in your journey and it takes you closer to the Father and to those that you have influence over, friends, family, loved ones. That's our, that's our hope. That's why we continue to show up week after week. And it's also an enjoyable conversation when we get together. And I know, John, you and I are both growing through this process. But the real hope here um, is that you listeners will be able to grow with us as well. So Romans 12, man, what does that look like in your life? And what can you do today to move further down that path that Paul described of living sacrifice, renewing your mind so that you can discern what the Father wants? John, any last thoughts before we put a bow on this one today? Yeah, not to send us too far down a road. Just a quick question that you we can all ask ourselves. What is our sons, what are our sons seeing us sacrifice? Mm. Chew on that one. It's a good one. All right, guys, you know the drill by now. Same bat time, same bat channel next week with another episode. Looking forward to it. Until then, adios. To send us your comments or questions, you can email us at feedback at the nextmanup.com. The theme music is by Jacob Stanifer at Jacob Stanifer Music, and this show is part of the NRT Podcast Network.